The FujiCast is an independent Loading Zone production. My grandma used to have lots of sayings. Things like, can't, never, could, and don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And right now, up to the end of July, if she was a friend of the FujiCast, like you are, she'd have been bowled over to receive 10% off all workshops, mentoring and presets, and actually anything else available on kevinmullinsworkshops.co.uk, which makes me think he might have sneaked in Get the Dog for Sale. <laughs> Just use the word FujiCast upon checkout and enjoy 10% off at kevinmullinsworkshops.co.uk and git. I think you're safe, really. Well, I'll tell you what, Kev, I cannot wait for... It's school holidays in a couple of weeks, isn't it? <laughs> I, I honestly can't Christmas wait. Christmas holidays. <laughs> God knows where we are. But, um, as you know, Sam, Sam does some teaching in the morning, so I, I'm left in charge of um, schooling. I have absolutely no idea what that two are on about most of the time. Mm. You know, and, and they're like, they're 10 and 12. <laughs> they're asking me questions. I'm thinking, I got no idea. Can't you just ask me art questions? <laughs> I know, I know. It's the same in our house. Listen, check this out. Um, okay. Rewrite these two sentences as one using a subordinating conjunction. You ready? Joy I- goes hiking. The weather is nice. Hang on, I'm just going to go to Grammarly.com. <laughs> right, a short diary entry from last weekend. Use each of the adverbials below to link your paragraphs. I went inside just... Stayed to... in bed. <laughs> no, I'm going to put it over there in the must-listen-more pile. I went inside just a moment ago, just to... Because, re- as, you, as you know, we record this at a different time to when it goes out. I went inside just to see how how schooling was... Uh, homeschooling was going on today, since uh, Daddy's in charge. And, actually, I'm not much in charge at the moment, clearly. And and our Jack said, could you watch my uh, animation that I've just made? I said, yeah, go on, play it to me, darling. And so um, <laughs> he's made a fight scene out of two Lego figures. They're just pummeling each other. <laughs> I'm not sure that this was actually what you were supposed to be doing. The Fuji cast. Yeah, I'm not sure it was uh, designed for that much gratuitous violence, that particular exercise, <laughs> but never mind. Anyway, welcome to the show. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, real me- mixed bag today, tech, non-tech, somewhere you share what you've been up to, stories of your photo lives. Keep sending them in, please. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Um, if you've emailed before, fabulous. You are officially what we know as a friend of the show. If you've never emailed before, now is the time to earn your first time writer badge, please. Um, welcome aboard those that don't shoot Fuji. We're going to go to, to Club Indulgence in, in a little while and read off some of those lovely reviews that you've uh, been sending in we read every single one by the way we really really do appreciate it Kev's book of the week this week is Hackney Studios oh Hoxton Mini Press oh it's one of your is this one of the ones that you got with the um, yeah the, oh, I, yeah the special deal yeah. you did yeah, yeah. Um, and of course after today's show some of the subjects get picked up in our private uh, Facebook group which we'd love for you to join it's a friendly place two main rules if you've got nothing nice to say don't say anything at all and no mic drop picks every picture post needs a reason and uh, of course uh, we have uh, another disaster story and uh, we'll hear today on on our interview from the former times picture editor now immeasurably talented landscape photographer and architect behind discover still a mindfulness approach to photography paul sanders uh, last week we very much covered the the mental health ground this week more on his style as a photographer and i I know sometimes they call it photographer at large or photographer at the coalface. I think Paul would definitely be a, a photographer at peace. So part two is coming up. Right, let's go to the questions. Do you want to kick off this week, Kev? OK, I've got one from Gunnar Isaacson. Oh, Gunnar, good. That's it. Where do you think he's from? Gunnar Isaacson. I, well, I see that's a little bit unfair because I do know where he's from. Oh. Because I've spoken to him. I, I did a... Um, I did um, a mentoring session with him, actually. Oh, oh, uh, really so cool. I know he's in New York. He is. Clifton Park, New York. Yeah. I thought he would But otherwise, like I would have said a Scandic country. Norway or yeah. Iceland or something. Because it is a good Scandic name, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm quite disappointed he's from New York, to be honest with you. Why? Yeah, well, I wanted him to be from Iceland. <laughs> anyway, I suppose we better still answer the question. Where they eat their grandmothers for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cheaper. A YouTuber was showing a YouTuber was showing how to do corporate headshots, and he, he had he, each of the people hold up a grey card in oh, front of them. Right. For at least one shot. Yes. This was explained as being to help with colour balance, but I don't understand how you would use this during post production in, say, Lightroom. Can you explain? Um, yeah, so I can explain. You can explain, probably, also. Yeah. I, who, use, I do this a lot, actually, when I'm um, doing film work. 
holding a grey card up because it's a really good thing to use your little pipette for, isn't it? And, and get some white balance rolling nicely. Yeah, so technically those grey cards are 19% grey. Mm. And the idea is that that's the most... Uh, I'm not sure whether natural is the right word to use, but the the, the nearest thing to neutral neutral grey white grey yeah, yeah. shade yeah. so what happens is the portrait the, the subject will hold the, cam- the card up the yep. photographer will take a picture of that then That's they'll right. put the card yeah. down yeah. and then when they go into Lightroom assuming the, the lighting hasn't changed in the entire shoot they can then just use the white balance tool in Lightroom to right. click on the grey card yeah. and that will uh, correct the white make the white balance perfect and you can then just adjust all of the other images based on the same white balance. Yeah. So it's it's for white balance adjustment. Um, I have to say, <laughs> do you do it? <laughs> Never. We Not used even for filming. Yeah. And and I've got, I, of course, I've got stacks of them. Yeah. But we used to in in the studio. <laughs> should do it. We're in the studio when when we had the portrait studio. When we were doing lots of Christmas portraits with kids and families and stuff, we used to use the grey card. Because uh, it has other, you know, some cards are just grey, some have lots of different colours yeah, and things on. Yeah. So we used to we give them the one with all the different colours on and uh, have the uh, one of the children hold it in front of his or her face. And they'd say, what's this for? I said, ah, very special tool. This tells us whether you've been good or not in time for Christmas. And <laughs> they'd say, what? I said, well, if the wrong colour comes up, we're going to have to talk to Santa. <laughs> or if you're a really good boy or girl during this photo shoot, not a problem at all. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> but I've, I've since actually, when you in my, I've got something in my. I still haven't found your thirty-five mil button. Uh, funny that. Have you ever seen one of these Sikonic? Um, yeah, yeah. I have one of them as well. Yeah. No, this is not yours. This is definitely mine. <laughs> no, no, no. I know. I've still got mine. I think I threw mine out. Pro Digi Color. What? It's Fortune. Those things. No. Nah, well, maybe it wasn't that one then. Yeah, hundreds, mine was and hundreds and hundreds mine of was pounds. White. This is a good way of measuring the Kelvin temperature. Yeah, that's it's what not, mine did. Yeah. Mine was called Sikonic. You, yeah. s- you stick it near a face and it would say, shoot at F8 at this well, and yeah, that Well, yeah, or stuff. also you can, um, you know, if I if I turn that, if I turn my aperture light on, okay, and I oh, turn the... Better. I can see you now. I know, look at that. Um, and I turn on the power. Hopefully there's some batteries, yeah. Right, I'm going to do a light. I'm going to measure the light output of that light. It is 4,920 kelvins. So now I can I'm, I can set you know the closest that I can on my camera and then get perfect white balance. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're yeah. not impressed. I'll put it back in there next to um, next to your 35 millimeter <laughs> 1.4. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes think the simplest thing, simplest routes are the best. Yeah. Um, but true. actually, with the white balance stuff, it's if you're doing high end stuff, certainly if you're doing kind of. Uh, very high-end kind of commercial yeah. photography or filming, then yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You'll see it. You'll, most people will know the clipboard, clapboard in films. Yes, you, they see the oh, clapboard, yes. and that's that's both for audio and also white balancing. Mm. You'll often see the reason why they're white and black is because they can take the white balance from it for the start of the clip, and also the reason why it goes clap. Yeah. It's for the, the audio. Sync. Yeah. Same syncing. Yeah. And yeah. of course, you write on the notes. Yeah. And you can say what scene it is. Scene one. All, all yeah. kinds of good things a mm. clapperboard is useful for. A friend of mine has got a clapperboard from uh, Star Wars. Can you believe that? From the original Star Wars. Because they use lots of clapperboards. And he's got a clapperboard from that film. Oh. That's got to be worth a fortune, isn't it? Yeah. I would imagine it's worth yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Uh, right. Was it yours, question or mine? No. I just did Gunnar Isaacson. Oh, you did that one. Right. Okay. This one is quite a long one, actually, uh, from Dennis Skyam, who um, I, I like the way people are signing off their emails now with uh, what they are, what they've been what they've been announced as on this this year's show. Dennis Skyam, he says, friend of the show, official guy you'd want to have a drink with at the pub, international man of mystery. <laughs> Uh, so we've called him all those things at some stage during the show. Um, hi, guys. Good to have you um, both, both back. Well, we never really went anywhere, did we? Uh, we had a week off <laughs> after, what was it, 74 episodes on, on the trot during the... Yeah, we never really had a week off, did we, as such? Not really. Anyway, like everyone else in the world, I've, been, uh, I've seen the striking photos coming out of America these days. And I have one. It's a question for arbitration in the International Pod Court of FujiCast. I wouldn't put us that high. Cool, blimey. Oh, dear. Stand by. Some are plain haunting some of these pictures. Some are hauntingly beautiful. I saw a photo by AP photographer Julio Cortez, for, and I've got a reference here which we could look at, of a protester carrying the stars and stripes upside down in a signal of distress in front of a burning liquor store in Minneapolis. And I just can't get that image out of my head. It screams at me that this photo really captures the zeitgeist, a word you'd never thought you'd hear on this show. 
of what we're seeing unfold that's an important photo of a moment that will change the course of history. So, so much so that as soon as possible, I want to buy a print of this photo and hang it on my wall. Now, I mentioned this to a friend and he was mortified and he called it a, a fetishization of human suffering. If this was a photo of a human being um, in pain or some such, I'd naturally not want to display it in my home. But my friend argues that having a photo of this burning building is disrespectful to the people who've lost their livelihoods in the riots. I don't agree, but at the same time, I wonder if these sorts of images need the distance of time to sort of become part of the, uh, the annals of history before it's acceptable to hang them up on the wall and consume them. What is your take? Best regard. I still don't understand this, but uh, oh no, that must be Ven Venlig Hills means best regards, doesn't it? Dennis Skyme. Yeah. Um, Isn't it illegal in America to f hold the flag upside down? Is it? I think so. Mm. I'm not, that, oh, so, that so, rings yeah. a bell. I'm sure that. Hen hence the hence, hence the the, the uh, zeitgeist. The, yeah, the zeitgeist. The, hence the protestation in, within this. Yeah, I think this particular the photograph. Fact the flag is upside yeah, down yeah, is part of the yeah. problem. But of course, you've got the burning building behind it, and you know, yeah, I suppose your friend has a point that. You know, a lot of a lot of a lot of people. You know, it's a it's a suffrage picture, isn't it? Yeah. But then, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm on on Photography Daily. To, um, I, I spoke to Tom Stoddart, and we did an episode on pictures that are particularly potent and important to you. And hanging in his office, he has two pictures. Uh, one Don McCullen one, which is the um, the Marine with the starey eyes. You yeah. Know, the the um, shell shocked Marine. Mm. And um, he has uh, Larry Burroughs one, uh, reached out hand, sort of in the mm. middle of conflict. Really mm. lovely. Well, I'd say lovely. See, there, there's me saying lovely. Awful. Awful, awful picture. So well done is what I meant to say. So, awful picture, beautiful awful picture, photograph. Awful picture, beautiful photograph. Yeah. But isn't, is, is there a, blimey, there's a, there, there's phrases that don't belong in the same sentence. Awful picture, beautiful photograph. Mm. Um, but no, he has them because he feels that way about that too. And equally that he thinks, um, you know, he takes a lot of inspiration from these photographers and those pictures. So they are to him artwork on a wall, but yeah. they're not something that would feel comfortable to many people to look at. Well, OK, put it put it this way, I suppose. I think take photography out of the equation and look at paintings. How many people have paintings on their walls of... Uh, people having their heads chopped off on horses and, uh, you know, all kinds of gruesome things went on in paintings. Uh, you know, they've become mm. ma masterful pieces of work and yes, they hang they on have, people's yeah. walks. Yeah, walls. Walls. So I suppose the same principle is true there, isn't it? It's it's not necessarily... I don't think holding having a picture on your wall of something like that implies that you agree with the message maybe dennis does i don't know that's not the point no i don't think dennis no, does no, no. i think but, what but, he's but, saying here is it's it's something that's changed the course of history these but photos the, po the point is uh, yeah having a picture on the wall of something doesn't necessarily mean that you are endorsing what's in the picture of course same as tom with mm. the picture of the marine mm. that doesn't mean that he's happy that picture was ever taken no nobody would ever want that picture to have been taken or for it to have occurred but it was, and it was important that it was taken. And you know, it's 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 now on his wall as a piece of art. So yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of the story. I have to say, um, I'm I wouldn't be. I think people are. I think perhaps it's been a little bit overthought. Um, you know, as long as it's. Do you mean his friends thinking too much about it? Possibly, yeah. yeah uh, overthinking. But but you know, I'm not here to say no. Say, you know, even with my Fujicast Court of Arbitration hat, judge on, hat judge, hat, <laughs> be, judge, judge, judge hat. As a judge, judge you, you'd have to make decisions. You can't please everyone, Judge Mullins. Okay, so I think then the answer is that we should go for a Pizza. recession. Oh, right. Yeah, we're going to recess. <laughs> right. And we will. Oh, I think we're already in recession. We, we're we're going to recess for the next three years. <laughs> And once the recession is over, we will we shall come back and, and resume yeah. this court of arbitration and make a decision. But in that time, we're just going to go and get drunk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and in that time, Dennis, do whatever you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree with you, actually. Um, never thought about it in terms of the famous um, paintings, but you're absolutely right. I mean, some of those... Oh, yeah. I suppose if you want to look at... Um, uh, the Battle uh, of Waterloo uh, painting. Well, also, if you go <laughs> to crucifixion... Religious, crucifixion, religious we'll iconification. Crucifixion pictures, yeah, yeah. yeah. All of them, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's ultimately, you know, of course you've got your kind of turners and stuff, which mm. are beautiful fields and cows and rivers and what mm. have you. Mm. That's I would love a Turner painting. Would you? Yeah. yeah. I can look at Turner paintings and just drop myself into it. Can you? 
Uh, Battle of Waterloo, not so much. No. There is... Uh, have you ever been to Lanzarote, the Canary Islands? I've been to one of them. Mm. Well, in the Canary Islands, anybody who's been there, you know, please write in and say, I've been there, Neil, I know what you mean. There is a... Uh, there, there's an artist there, or there was, he, he sadly um, got killed when he turned out of his... Um, his beautiful studio that he's got in his uh, he had a light blue jaguar i can't imagine there were many light blue jags in lanzarote years and years ago and uh, and the, and had a collision with a truck it was a terrible story but he was the artist of the the canary islands in many respects and one of the reasons why a lot of the a lot of the um the doors are because if you go to the canary islands i don't think it's so true these days i think a lot of that tradition has gone but for a long time there were green blue or i think you could have natural wood and it was all that the sort of the artist in residence across the canaries had said no we're gonna we're not gonna have any high rises on that particular island and all the doors have to be green blue or natural wood was down to him and he had this gorgeous studio a white studio and it, it built it into the side of the lava flows in in lanzarote this house and this studio mm. I was built into the side of the lava flows. In fact, one of the windows, you look out, and if you pick the right time of day, you could be looking at a moonscape. It's mm. quite incredible. Mm. But um, he has uh, these most immense pictures. I'm not, I'm, I'm, they're not Turner-esque, I suppose, because they're all modern art. But that's, should, that- I, I just, should I just go and put a ticket on my car? <laughs> you know, whenever a bit I go into a store, you don't want to hear it. All right, I won't tell you the rest no, no, of the story. No, no, go on. No, I don't want to. No, no, go. No, I've actually forgotten the point that I was going for. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, that you know, that they are pictures that I could fall into. Beautiful modern art pictures on huge cavernous walls. Yeah, yeah. And I actually think I've seen some of that guy's guy's work. Caesar Manrique. Caesar Manrique, is that yeah. his name? We Caesar shall link Manrique. to him or yeah. his... Uh, he still has an art foundation. His work, his yeah, foundation. Yeah. Caesar Manrique. Right, your go. Okay, I've got a question from Dominique Martel from right. Quebec in Canada, Quebec City. Right. It says, hi guys, I really enjoy the podcast. Nice job, exclamation mark. Nice job. I use Lightroom uh, Classic with subscription and I'm about to change my computer. What's the best way to move my library, catalogs and picture to the new computer? Right. Should I use the latest backup or should I export the whole catalogue and uh, uh, from the old computer and re-import it onto the new computer or simply copy all the files from the new computer, JPEG, RAF, LRCAT, etc.? Thank you. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I'll give it to Kev and let him do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's multiple ways of doing it. You can do the export as catalogue. Um, you won't kind of um, won't come to any real problems with that. It might just take a while, depending on how big the catalogue is. I would, assuming that all of the images and stuff are, are easy enough to do this, I would just dump it all onto an external hard drive, including the, the Lightroom catalogue, RAV files, JPEGs, and take them across to the new computer and um, just reopen it. And Lightroom, if the files are not in the same location, same drive letter, Lightroom will say, I can't find them, and you just point to them, and then it will find them all. Very simple. Um, the one thing to be a little bit cautious of is the preview files. Your preview files may well be very big, and it could be a good opportunity to just ditch those. If you don't need the preview files, um, then just just get rid of those previews. Um, and that's it. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You can't really do too much to, to get it wrong. Just copy rather than cut. Okay, so don't, if you're copying it onto an external hard drive, don't cut them onto an external hard drive. Right. Get it onto the new computer, and only when you're happy that it's on the new computer, may you then say goodbye to the old computer. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully that solves your problem, or your question. Right, let's do some uh, reviews. Then uh, we're into this week's interview. Um, still got the book to come and a, uh, a longish disaster story today. I'll try not to make it as long as a Lanzarote story. <laughs> Borg have rigid <laughs> right um, you go first this is from Singe 27 Singe Singe love 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 not John Singe and Smith mm, could be it could be couldn't it could be yeah. a love 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 podcast it's easy going banter mostly Fuji but encompasses other brands too fun and light hearted they bring the social back to social media and with great interviews best sound quality this side of radio <laughs> great Facebook group too Neil and Kevin have it covered boom there I you go I thought you were going to say great faces for radio then <laughs> <laughs> I definitely got a face for radio uh, this one's from Bailey not could be the could be he doesn't listen to this show like your new best friends after discovering uh, Kevin Mullins on YouTube a few months back oh uh, when looking into wedding photography with Fuji equipment see now that goes to show that how important it is to have a YouTube presence isn't it yeah and it also goes to show that it's almost definitely not David Bailey 
Do you not think he watches YouTube? I don't think he's uh, thinking about doing a, a wedding photography business. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I stumbled across this podcast, now eagerly await each episode. Yeah, it's definitely not Bailey. Not David, anyway. Mm-hmm. Straight talking. Oh, that could be David. Non-faff chat around all things photography. Great bants and some really meaningful interviews. My partner would give this a naught or one star review for my lovely new founded habit of collecting photography books, which is your fault, Mullins. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there we go. Your turn. This is from a BSKLES. Biskless. Excellent podcast, very informative and entertaining to listen to. While the comedic banter alone is worth coming back for, Neil and Kevin are knowledgeable and passionate about the art and the industry. Don't let the name put you off if you're not a Fujifilm shooter. There, while there is some technical discussion that is Fujifilm related, most of the discussion is not. Mm. Keep up the good work, gents. One from Refaces. Um, great review. It says great review. My first time listening to the podcast. I am sold. That's it. Uh, have you got one shorty there? Yeah, Kit in Canada. I've been listening to the food cash. <laughs> Kit in Canada. I've been listening to the Fuji cast for Fuji some cast. weeks, and it gets better and better. Highly yeah. recommended. All right, and, that, and that's it. Remember, if you you sent in one of those reviews, or if you made one, uh, as always, you're our favourite listener, and we mean it. We sincerely do. Right, this week's interview. Then you remember on last Monday's show, Paul Sanders, former Times picture editor, now incredible landscape photographer, and the engineer, the the architect behind Discover, still talking about his very personal journey from photographer to pictures editor to landscape and mindfulness work. This week we learn more about Paul in part two of this two-parter and it's the photography side of his work today, finding out what makes him tick, why he shoots black and white and how he comes to make these incredible, quite beautiful works of art. Paul Sanders. Your pictures are very minimalist. Um, How long do you take to find and and make a composition? I'm I'm assuming you're no longer driving around in quite that, maybe I'm using a clumsy expression here, but crazed manner that you once were. (laughs) No, definitely not. Um, I now only photograph in, um, let's say, faraway locations or drive to locations. When I'm doing workshops or talks nearby, most of the stuff I shoot now is, is very close to home. Sometimes in the garden we're very lucky that we live out in the countryside um i've got some woods opposite the house which i love and we're 40 minutes from the kent coast so occasionally i'll wander down there or down to the sussex coast um but i don't you know i don't need to drive anywhere i i now fully appreciate beauty is actually everywhere you know you don't need to travel to a well photographed location to take a, a a picture that works for you you know, I'd taken my home area for granted for so long. Thing, you know, a bit like you live in London, you never go and visit anything in London. <laughs> um, it's only when you move out of London do you then go and visit everything in London because all of a sudden it's not on your doorstep. I, I would deliberately ignore Kent a lot of the time, but I'm so lucky to live here. Yeah, we don't have mountains and massive waterfalls, but it's a different kind of beauty. And I think when you start as a photographer, you tend to put too much into your pictures. You overdo the information. Um, and I just started simplifying and simplifying and simplifying because my head was complicated enough. It was noisy enough. Um, there was so much going on. I was so distracted by everything that the simpler my pictures, the more I could understand what was coming out. That just started to work as um, almost as a style. But it, I, I had to be very careful because... You know, people put you in boxes very quickly, you know, so people will always say, oh, you you just do long exposure um, or you just do landscape. Uh, And I'm not one thing or another. I'm just a photographer. Um, You know, I'm happy behind the lens with a person in front of me of interest. And it has to be an interesting person, not just a random person, but an interesting person, whether it's a building or a landscape or the sea or a lake or a tree or a gate or a flower, um, you know, I mean, last week I was photographing the scraps of paper that came off my book, um, <laughs> you know, when, when we trimmed it. Um, <laughs> and it, it's just being able to look at something, go, do you know what, I really like that. And that's where my photography is, is I really like that. You know, I think that whatever that is, is beautiful or interesting to me. I don't give two hoots, really. And not in an arrogant way as to where other people like what I shoot or not. And, you know, it does sound a bit arrogant when you say I don't care what people think. But 
I don't, but it's not through arrogance. It's through self-concern, self-healing, if you like, because the only person that my pictures have to please is me. Yeah. Um, and that's where often we lose sight because we're always thinking, you know, if you're in a camera club, oh, I hope the judge likes it or I hope the other members like it, yeah. you know. Yeah. If you're doing qualification, then the, the committee's got to like it. Um, if it's going in for an exhibition, you want other people to like it. You know, you're putting it on Facebook or Instagram. It's, it's nice to get that validation. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I've got a, a lovely group of followers on Instagram and Facebook and, uh, you know, of my newsletter and things like that. Um, and they're really supportive. But if I had no people following me on any social media, I would still take the same photographs that I do. Um, because they're important to me and I enjoy the moment that I'm taking them. So every, every stage of my kind of development into whatever photographer people want to say I am is basically a journey of self-discovery and self-expression. That sort of sums it up, really. I don't know whether that's the answer you were looking no, for. No, I, I, well, I think if you start to wear other people's opinions as well, you're, you're straight back to square one as, as well, Paul, aren't you, really? And I think you made the right decision in that respect. It, it's nice to have your work liked, but if you don't like it, if you're not shooting true to yourself, you might get people saying your work is, is nice, um, you know, that they like it, but it will always feel a bit empty to you. Yeah. People talk a lot about getting it right in camera, but your approach isn't just simply a, an exposure exercise or long exposure exercise, as you've, you've now identified as well. You use filters and, and an array of those to achieve your signature look. Can you take me through that yeah. process? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole getting it right in camera thing, I like to get it as close to right as I can. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to not do anything in Lightroom or Photoshop. So... I don't want people thinking I'm some kind of amazingly gifted photographer that can turn sow's ears into silk purses you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> using a film simulation. It doesn't quite work like that. But what I do is I, I mean, for the long exposures, I, I use Lee neutral density filters and I've got everything in my bag from a two stop up to a 15 stop. And I will combine those um, in whatever sandwich is necessary and i also use graduated filters a lot now i i could do it in lightroom i'm sure but i like producing as close to the effect i want in camera and then using lightroom and photoshop to enhance rather than using lightroom and photoshop to make the picture i'm assuming as well these are drop-in filters rather than screw-on yeah. filters yeah i am not a fan of the the screw-on filter because they they limit the creativity that you can have a slide-in filter you know you can put it anywhere and angle it at any point yes. um you know so it's your decision rather than the manufacturer's decision as to where the grad falls which is why i've always supported lee i think their filters are great um i like the team at lee filters they've always been very supportive of my work and they're british made which is very important mm. to me um but the whole idea of it is that i use those filters to create something in the viewfinder that reflects how i'm feeling about what the landscape is saying to me and that's the important thing so that when i get back I can look at the file and go, right, this is where I was going. And all I need to do now is add a bit of contrast or, you know, lessen the contrast off or just bring the blacks down a tiny bit because I don't want to spend a lot of time behind my computer, you know, which is odd at the moment, seeing as I spent more time behind my computer now in a day than I used to when I was at the Times. Um, but for me, the joy of photography is being outside with the wind in my face and the mm. rain kind of bashing on my waterproofs and, you know, that experience. The, the experience of photography for me isn't sitting behind my computer. For some people, the experience of photography is the computer bit. So the, there's, no, there's no wrong or right. Um, it's just what suits you. And I think whatever suits you, go with. I don't think, you know, getting it right in camera should be held up as a sort of a benchmark. Just as I think, you know, shooting without any filters or um, exposure control should be held up as a benchmark. I, I think every person has an individual approach that works for them. And if you try to do it in the way that other people do, you won't be happy. You've got to find your own mm -hmm. your own way of doing it. And my way of doing it is I get it close as close to right as I can, and then I tweak it. Um, I don't shoot to the right and get as much information as I can on the sensor because that's not the way I work. I just let it sit where it sits. You know, so often my files are very much stacked towards the black end, which means I've got very little information to work with. 
so therefore I don't work the files too hard. But if I'm teaching photography, I will always teach people that the more information they get on the sensor, the better image they will get, because I don't want to just make people clones of me. I want them to be able to work out what they want and then throw the stuff away that is irrelevant to them. You know, and I think that's a very important thing that when you're helping people with their photography, you don't turn them into you. You know, as I found, Joe Cornish is the best Joe Cornish on the market. Yes. Um, you know, and I know Joe often says that people do Joe Cornish better than he does. There are there are people out there who take who go to locations that I've photographed and photograph them in a similar style to me, but photograph them in a much better way. But I never look at them and think, oh, I wish I'd done it like that because I did it the way I did it at a certain moment based on how I was feeling and a certain set of weather conditions that will never be repeated. I don't worry about it. I will show people exactly where I went and exactly how I shot if that's what they really want. That standing in the rain thing that you talk about, there's a, uh, yeah. um, a lot of the images look like they're taken through mist, and, and that is because of this long exposure. And, and, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you just go looking for the mist, but maybe you do. But but photographing through the rain obviously can, can create that sort of image as well, can't it? Yes, it, it does. Um, you know, especially if it's heavy rain and you're shooting into the light a little bit, you, you do get a slightly misty, softer look. I like that. Um, I love working with the rain, you know, so you, you're shooting through the rain, but I always try and make sure the rain's at my back so it's not blowing onto the lens or, you know, I've got a big umbrella, um, I've got good waterproofs. I love being out in the rain. I think it's really exciting. I think yeah. photography can, well, it is a very solitary occupation. These yeah. beautiful images that you create, they, they can make me, this in a good way, I want you to understand this, Paul, make me feel quite alone in the places that you show. Like I'm tr- <laughs> truly stuck in a moment. Uh, and I, I know that's partly how landscape works. You kind of teleport somebody into the scene, but you also especially so because they're completely serene and that has to be purposeful. Yeah, I, I rarely, rarely like my landscapes to have people in. I like to feel like I'm the only person there that I'm the only person experiencing that moment. And I I believe that when you're really connected to the landscape, the moment of beauty is just for you. Even if there are other photographers around, they'll be at a slightly different angle, so they'll see it differently. Um, Their moment will be different. So, you know, I purposefully don't really like people in my pictures. I've included them a couple of times for scale, but it's never really never really done it for me um so i like the landscape to be just the landscape just how it is and allow people who are viewing the pictures the freedom to interpret it in their own ways you know so their own sense of scale or you know questioning of of scale and i want you know like you said i want people to feel that when they look at the pictures they're the only people looking at them um you know or in them i think viewing photographs should be as immersive in some ways as as the taking and I, I think you only get that when you stand in front of a, a, a print or you hold a print. Well, I want I want to come to the tactile nature of the print element of your work in a second, but I yeah. can't believe it's taken this long to to ask you this question through this interview. But um, why black and white? Why not colour? Colour irritates me. I find colour distracting. I liken it to having my arm rubbed with a cheese grater. <laughs> my goodness. Um, <laughs> I look at colour pictures and I can really appreciate their beauty, but. When I look at a landscape, I don't see the colour. I see tone, I see texture, you know, I see pattern, I see rhythm, I see lines. I don't see the colours. It just doesn't do it for me. Mm. I've always had a fascination with black and white. I mean, I started, you know, my first photographs were on black and white film. Um, I worked in a black and white dark room. My love of black and white, it, it goes all the way back to me starting in photography. And I like the simplicity of it. And I think in some ways... Colour, for me, when I was going through my real mental health battle, colour was just more noise added to a situation. Um, It was more distraction. And I like the strength in black and white, but I like the subtlety. I like how clean it can be. And I sometimes find with colour that people just jack the colours up to make a picture look good. And, you know, if you listen to people and they say the reaction to the picture is, God, the colours are amazing. That's not the photograph is brilliant. That's the colours are amazing. Mm. I think when people look at the colour over the content, that's really sad. And there are some amazing people who do colour photography. You know, their work is is mind-blowing. But I just don't see that way. 
I, I see the world in shades of grey, often shades of dark grey, um, or shades of, you know, tones of white. I use the colour. This is the odd bit. I, uh, although I shoot black and white and colour, I, I sh- you know, I'm quite old fashioned because I shoot JPEGs in black and white and my raw files are, obviously they come out in colour, right. but I use yeah. the colour to allow me to express the tones in a picture. So like I'll often shoot with a, the red filter on to increase the intensity of, of blues or I'll alter it round to change the way a, a picture will, will look because I, I think, you know, in the old days we used to use filters on black and white film because black and white film saw colour. Yes. And, you know, so there's nothing wrong with using the colour information to produce the best black and white file that I can produce. And I, I think a lot of people forget that black and white actually is a is, is a response to colour. So it's just a different way of seeing colour. You see it as tones mm. rather than colours. The amazing Paul Sanders. And if you'd like to see more of what we've been talking about in terms of Paul's approach and learn more about the mindfulness work that he does with photographers, then discoverstill.com. Discoverstill.com is certainly a website you truly need to immerse yourself in. And of course, as ever, there'll be relevant links on the Fujicast show page. There's a special long episode, too, covering what we've talked about, of course, but with an even longer study of how he works, the mindfulness approach to not just of his photographic work, but his life, which is coming on Photography Daily. He's, uh, he's my first Focus Edition guest this coming weekend, which is a new Saturday members episode going live from this weekend. And in case you haven't heard, this is what my my other podcast is all about. Photography Daily. If you're wondering what to listen to for the rest of the week after this Fujicast edition and you're still hungry for more, then be sure to visit my new podcast, Photography Daily, which drops Monday to Friday at 9am UK time, 4am Eastern. Monday to Thursday, inspiring photographers share their stories. Do I really want to risk my life for getting my stuff printed? If the images are not beautifully composed, people will just want to turn away from the images. But I remember the assignment because it was a huge auditorium and there were hundreds and hundreds of people in the room and all I had was a 35 millimeter. And the Friday photo walk is a longer outing with the show's mailbag as we go on assignment together. Photography Daily, available on all your favorite podcast apps and at photographydaily.show. Photography Daily. Right, back to the questions. Kev, you go. Okay, this is from long time listener and uh, very much a friend of the show <laughs> Ali Ah, oh, Ali Stewart Ali Stewart yes hi Kevin Neal I'd love to hear your thoughts on the current trend for businesses to have an Instagram feed mm. that has a definite aesthetic look to it mm. I do think that a well curated colour coordinated every sixth square a standard quote and almost every photo looking exactly the same sort of account yes. does good yes but does it mean that we all being niched into our own wee corners mm. <laughs> Wee Corners, by the way, for those who uh, don't understand Scottish, is uh, is not somewhere where you might go and, uh, no, you know, Kev. it's small corners. Yes, small corners. I am not a jack of all trades, but I do think that I have strengths in various genres and style, uh, styles of photography. Yeah. I can shoot a wedding in a variety of styles. My newborns don't all need to look the same, and I'm perfectly at home in a building site or on my studio shooting food. If I put all of these on my website, then I don't think that I'd fit with the current trend of what the website and Instagram gods say we should do in 2020. Anyways, what do you think? Of course, of course, what you're talking about here is if your grid shows up, uh, you know, on on your on your website, on your front page of your website, it's nice to have a grid that you know, has, has got some sort of continuity to it or consistency. Yeah. Or does it have to? Because actually, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to think more and more that uh, an Instagram feed could have, you know, could, could have bits of everything. I've not... I'm, I'm just looking at Instagram now. My wife, who's supposed to be teaching, is, look, she just put up a picture of a beetle on a sunflower. That is not teaching. Is she in this garden, then? No, that must be one at school. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, teaching's going well this morning. So my, my, my personal thoughts on the Instagram stuff is I never, ever look at the grid. Do I you never not? look at somebody's profile grid. I do. I don't. Do you not? Never. Okay. I mean, I sometimes look at their profile to look for a link. Yeah. But I never scroll down. I only ever scroll up through my feed or right. down through my feed. Right. So for that reason, it doesn't really affect me. What I would say with the people that have uh, beautiful Instagram layouts, their, their feed layouts, yes. and I may well be off the mark here. Yeah. See, I, I do that, for example, on one of mine, which has quote, picture, quote, picture, quote, picture. Yeah, well, that's probably what she's talking about yeah, then. Yeah. Does, that, does the time and effort involved in doing that 
taste and blood. bear in mind i know you very well Luminate. you're one of my best friends and i've never ever seen that on your instagram <laughs> you've never seen this particular instagram account have you no, um, well, what no, a not. waste of time <laughs> but yeah well that's what it comes down to doesn't it time now the thing is with instagram you've got a lot of people who are influencers right yes. or wrong me they're influencers yeah. and so their their currency is instagram likes that's yes. ultimately where they make their money and that's that's good for them well mm-hmm. done um so it makes sense for to make their instagram uh landing page a you know a sexy one because mm. th- that's that's really what they want for us who are selling wedding p- photography or baby photography or whatever, or whatever it is yeah, yeah. then uh, yeah i mean it to me it doesn't i would rather stick up random pictures that i think i'm are going to attract clients mm. than stick spend my time worrying about a well curated well balanced yeah. Uh, you know, thing where it's not going to make me necessarily make me money. I mean, y- if you look at um, somebody like Josh Jackson's Instagram feed, it's not yes. easy for me to say. It's Josh K. Jack, isn't it? It's Josh K. Jack yeah. is his feed, yes. and his name is Joshua K. Jackson. Yeah. Now, he's a London street photographer. He's and amazing he's as well, isn't he? Absolutely beautiful. And his feed is all, it's very consistent. Yes. Colours, mostly primary colours, mm-hmm. uh, highly saturated, you know, edited in a certain way, etc. And it looks really very nice. I, I would like to say, though, he changed recently, didn't he? Because he was doing everything within white, um, almost like matted. If you if you go down yeah. his feet, he was, he was doing everything in, in, in like behind white mats. Mm-hmm. But now he's gone full image again. Yeah. Yes, he has. And well, for whatever reason, I don't know. But yeah. the point is, he makes money from Instagram. Yes. So, yeah. you know, Instagram is his main portal. Instagram is where he will be booking shoots from you know etc and all of that kind of stuff so he's using instagram as his marketing mechanism right Mm -hmm. as his as his agent if you like whereas we're not instagram for us is a platform to to help people discover us but do you think if we used it better like like what ali's suggesting here that that we may too be able to use it potentially i just think time wise and effort wise Mm. um and and you know what i i Honestly, I have to say <laughs> that when you showed me that that one with all of the quotes and everything, you thought you, you lost the world to live. Uh, no, no, it wasn't that. I, I did think it. Lo- I mean, it looks striking. It yeah, does look striking. Yeah, yeah. But I did think, what's the point? Well, yeah, I haven't used it for a long time. So. Yeah, uh, that's that's me. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm pretty. Peter McKinnon, who who is a YouTuber that we we follow, although I've not lot, watched a lot of Pete's stuff of, of late actually. But um, but his Instagram feed actually is is a work of art. I mean, he always looks at colours. Yes. And as the year goes, you know, at the moment he's still on blues because it's well, actually he should be on summer colours. Hang on, that's just completely shot my theory out the the window. But usually it is it's. You can see the the, uh, yeah, the yeah, year yeah. change with different colours. Ah, nope. oh, here we go, autumnal, look. And yeah. then everything goes to these beautiful sort of rich autumnal colours. Absolutely. And yeah. and that's be- it is beautiful and it makes a lot of sense. But don't yeah. forget that he is that's the way he's making money. He's not yes. selling wedding photography on no, Instagram. No. He's using it to promote himself. Good heavens. And his- 133,000 likes on a picture. Yeah. <laughs> But great. I mean, it's great. All those people that are doing it that way yeah. and, are, are, and are doing it for the right reasons that way, then, yeah, it makes sense. But I, d- I just don't think for us it's, it's, not, it, not it's the, the thing not, to do. Not the first thing to think about. No, not no. the first thing to think about. Okay. But, you know, if you want to do it, do it well. Si- Simon Blackley from uh, Images of People, photographer, Images of People. That must must be his website. Uh, hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. I'm wondering if you ever get clients saying, but all the shots in the church are too dark. I don't know why they speak like that, but um, when the church in question was, in fact, as gloomy as anything. It happened to me a couple of times when I've deliberately tried to match the actual lighting without flash. So, he's, uh, you know, trying to make a fair representation is Simon of what, what he actually saw and what the day was actually like. I think the problem is that people see photos taken on mobile phones, which makes everything look as though it was shot outside on a bright day and, and believe that's what uh, we should all be aiming for. How do you handle this before or after the event? Good question, Simon. Um, I mean, I, I haven't had that, to be fair, because usually... Even if it's a dark church, I'm usually looking at a low-key image, but looking at one portion, you know, which might be some light that's coming in from one of the one of the windows as being as as being the barometer of the correct exposure. So there's always part of the photo that, if it was any brighter, the whole thing would be o- overexposed and blown out. Yeah, I think it's interesting. He said that you know, or seemed to imply that you'd get better pictures with an iPhone. 
So I'm not sure that would be the case if it was if it was dark. It's, if it's dark, it's dark. Yeah, but and they they always seem to boost everything, don't they? Really, you never you never an iPhone won't give you a picture that that unless you go into it and of course drop the exposure by sliding your finger down once you've got the yeah once you've selected exposure. But normally they just give you ah oh, here's everything bright and beautiful in the world ra- rather than. That's just metering and post production, yeah. isn't it? It's not the fact that it's the camera inside the iPhone yeah, is most, better than it. Yeah, but most people aren't doing that, are they? They're not with their fingers not going on and changing the exposure to so so you you end up with this you know life being bright instead of life being what it really is that's what he's that's mm, what he's getting okay at fair enough yeah um yeah i mean it's uh, i've never had that that kind of question uh, uh thing from a client if you did though what, what would you say i am so confused that would be my answer <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. No, I would say, look, this is this is what it is. I, you know, yeah. it, it's hard. It's hard to to process that because when you're shooting in a very dark church, you mm. are concentrate. I'm always spot metering. I'm concentrating, like you just said, on the slithers of light. I'm looking for shadow yeah, and shade. Yeah. And well, that's how you create the three dimensional look. That's well. it. Yeah, that's that's what you're going to deliver. Your if it's a really dark church, use a flat. If you re- if you want it to look like it's not a really dark church. Use flash. Yeah, wait, 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 wait to get told off for that. Though. That's no the only more way to flash, do it. young man. Yeah, but that's that's you know it's the only way to do it. It's yeah. it's unrealistic. If somebody did come back to me and say, yeah, "Really dark in that church. The pictures yeah. are really dark," I would say, "Yeah, because it's really dark in that church." Mm. You, you, of course, they, we're not, I'm not just I mean, we're not talking about the technicalities of being able to shoot in a dark church. That's no. a different thing. No, uh, so you yeah. need to be able to understand that sometimes you might need if it's really dark, you might even need a monopod or something. You, yes. you know, you, you've got to think about shutter speed and all that. The technicalities of it is different. But if a client said it's too dark yeah. and it was dark, then I would then it was. just say, well, you know, with all due respect, client, I remember clients, remember them. <laughs> I'm just looking up Simon's uh, website. Oh, Ooh, that's a nice pickup. Amazing picture straight away. SimonBlackley.com. Um, yeah. Yes. Very nice. Ooh. Yeah. So you definitely got the technical know how. Yeah. Oh, is a, that. Um, that looks like um, that famous actor. It's not, though, is it? Uh-huh. No. Could be. Anyway. I did think the other person I saw reminded me of somebody. Yeah. Is this mouse not working? Nice work on that. Uh, no, it's not. I've not put batteries in it. <laughs> no, <laughs> your mouse, I will return batteries to it. But we're in lockdown, don't you know? Oh, we're, yeah, I shouldn't have yeah. touched it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the mouse in the Yeah, bin. oh, God, Burn I'm going to have to sort of spray everything now twice. Um, right, should we go for a book? Yes. Um, th- this week, um, now, you got busy with a checkbook over over parts of lockdown, didn't you? And you, you ordered uh, something very special. Well, um, from I, these people. So yeah, Hoxton Mini Press, which oh. is a lovely, lovely little um, I don't know if boutique's the right word to use it, but a boutique printing company, phot- photographic company in the east end of London, obviously right. Hoxton. Yep. Uh, they they produce books that are usually um, in and around the east end of London, Hackney, Hoxton, that kind of area. And uh, the story of it was essentially a guy that was taking pictures of um, this this man that he became friends with on the streets and that became the Hoxton's first book oh, uh, yeah. which was a while oh, back I remember that story yeah. um, and and uh, and so Hoxton Mini Press much like everybody else were you know having a bit of a struggle during the, the, the lockdown and so they did a Kickstarter campaign to to raise some funds and one of the packages was the London what they call the London package which was 10 books about London um, and uh, I got I think only not only one of them I already had. One of them, yeah. So nine, yeah. nine were brand new. That's for me. quite a result. Yeah, it was excellent, and it was. I think it was something like a hundred pounds to get that collection, and effectively it was a series. It was a uh, the, if I bought them all individually, it would have cost something like two hundred and fifty pounds. So it was a win-win for mm, me. Mm. Another thing that I probably shouldn't have spent my money on, but I really wanted to help them out. So that arrived. The camera arrived. Anything else you bought? You want to tell Gemma about? <laughs> um, uh, I'm not even going to talk about it. <laughs> the um, and so yeah, so the I got my ten books from. The Mini Press, they they managed to get raise a load of money, which is great. So because they do, they're such a good company. Yeah. And this, so this book I've brought in, which is one of the the ten, is called Hackney Studios, East London Creatives and Their Spaces. And the photographer was Jenny Lewis. Oh, what an interesting idea! So yeah. because uh, I love that when you look behind the scenes and um and and yeah, it's great. It's just it's se- essentially environmental portraiture of yeah. East London artists, of which yeah. of course there's going to be loads of them. Yeah, sadly a lot less now than there was many years yeah. ago, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but but it's a beautiful book, and it's it's you know pretty much I think all in color. There's a couple of kind of flip out pages that have 
so the time, contact sheets contact and time, like, and time yeah, stamps and it's stuff not, like that. Yeah. Not so much time stamps, but you know, just contact so you can see exactly who's who and where the where the pages are. It's a really beautifully presented book. Uh, it says on the front, Jenny Lewis spent over four years photographing artists in East London. Each artist recommended another, and so that the image in the books reflect an organic and close knit community. What now, a great idea! This is uh, yeah. interesting. Yes. Really. Um, this was one of my ideas many, many years ago. Yeah, he's writing this down. Look, this was my idea. Yeah, I'm writing right, it down now. Was um, to, <laughs> to photograph to photograph um, people that start with somebody I know and then yeah. get them to uh, nominate the next person. Well, like the degrees uh, book that Andy Three got. Degrees Andy got six degrees, isn't it? Six degrees. Three yeah. degrees is a band. <laughs> when will I see you again? All those numbers. <laughs> Uh, and Andy Gotts did that. He did, um, and yeah. he he got lucky, didn't he, with a couple of people? Mm. And because they were super super Hollywood stars, mm. they started. They, they actually, I think, a few of them um, got on the phone in in front of him and actually you know, phoned ahead to to the next super Hollywood star and said, "I'm with Andy. Any chance here? Yeah. yeah, you're in London next week. Perfect, Andy. I've I've, I've set you up with um, you know yeah. a myriad of Hollywood stars. Yeah, I was rather thinking more about just strangers yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean Andy Dave. Gotts, i love Andy Gotts' stuff <laughs> yeah. by the way yeah um anyway so back to the book yeah touchy tape uh yeah, hackney studios east london creatives and their spaces by jenny lewis hoxton mini press mm. and it's uh much like that the hoxton mini press stuff you can get it on their website and they do limited editions prints and uh collector's editions and everything or you can also get them on amazon and uh various other places it's sort of a voyeuristic nature isn't there to so looking into other people's workspaces particularly artists who you know it's have lovely. these these fabulous sometimes really grimy kind of really sort of places and some some are really sort of of minimalistic aren't they and i would say the challenge I love about that the challenge with this type of photography it when I, when i'm looking at this now the challenge for jenny as she was shooting this i would imagine is um the combination of l- getting the light right but mm. also you know the environmental background so we want to show off their their studio that's the whole point of it what we don't really want to do is just have them as a as a person in front of a nice window with nice light because that doesn't yeah. show off the background. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of a lot of beautiful um, light at play, window light. Um, but in all cases, it's also using because that's the whole point of an environmental portrait, right? So you see the environment. So it's it's natural not light. just a portrait. Yeah, as far as I can tell, it's all mm. natural light. Yeah. Um, and you know but with a very good consideration of the background. Love that one. Page 38. Becky Sloan and Joseph Pellin, filmmakers. And okay. there's um, some puppets and things like that. They're making <gasps> puppetry films. I'm just going to randomly go to page 42. Juno Calypso, mm-hmm. artist. And uh, so there's a couple of them that have little quotes. And she says, Juno says, I love the colour pink. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, I read this the other day. This is beautiful. What other colour makes people feel so awkward or embarrassed? It's juvenile and pretty, fleshy and erotic. It's the colour of innocence, but also of fantasy. It stirs up everything we're conflicted about as a society, and I love playing with that. Wow. Now, that's somebody who that's doesn't need Grammarly. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, I bet she doesn't remember the name of the fellow what did that thing the other day on the telly <laughs> machine. Yeah. All right. So, um, Hoxton, uh, Hoxton Press, Mini Press Hackney yeah. Studios, yeah. East London Creatives, and their spaces by Jenny Lewis. People do like looking into to background. People like stuff that you're otherwise not privy to. Um, so, um, for example, at the moment, I've started leaving the tape... Ro- ah, what old-fashioned phrase? I like this old-fashioned phrase. The tape rolling at the end of an interview. When, when I've finished with the interview, often I, I go on talking for another 15, 20 minutes, and some of the stuff you talk about is really quite funny. And I think um, I'm beginning to save them now because I think that, that is quite an interesting feature in itself, mm. actually, what happened when the tapes, tape, tape stopped rolling, but, you know, rolled on, as it were. But there we go. Um, website one here from Ian March. I know you've done some stuff on websites, but I'm checking and double-checking and triple-checking before I make the move. So this is very important how you answer this. I'm not a noob when it comes to web design. In fact, I remember many moons back using Dreamweaver. Mm. Have you ever used Dreamweaver? Yeah. Yeah, I, I designed my first site on Dreamweaver. I can't yeah. believe I, I actually knew how to do stuff like that. They still that. do it. Why that would was, you want to use it was these all, days? Though? I remember when uh, Adobe bought Macromedia, yeah. who made Dreamweaver. Yeah. Oh, I'd understand why you'd want to do it if you want to do something particularly yeah. special. That doesn't. Yeah, yeah. 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 you can do. Yeah. It's, it's mostly for design layout. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. It's all uh, about separation these days. Separating the UI and the data. Yeah. <laughs> what did he just say? 
I, I went flash mad for a while, then I settled back down. Do you remember having a flash mad sites as well? Macromedia were God. the ones who started Flash as well. Oh, yeah. were they? Yeah, right. Macromedia Flash. That's why Adobe bought them as well. Ah. Yeah, Flash. Woof. Why did Flash disappear, by the way? Well, in a nutshell, because Steve Jobs said, we will never play Flash on an iPhone. And, uh, of course, when the iPhones became huge, that was the end of them. So that was but they were security risk. Flash is a, was and still is a security risk. Why? Why? Because it's an embedded piece of code and, like, websites... Security yeah. and stuff has moved a long way. So, yeah. I mean, even Adobe... I think, actually, funny enough, this year is when they finally switch it off. Yeah. Um, for the last five years, they've kind of said, yeah, it's no longer on development. Nothing's happening with it. Uh, but now they're going to finally... Pull the plug. Pull the plug. Go on. Um, he goes on to say, I use WordPress at the moment with Divi Designer, uh, which is driving me nuts. I know you've both been discussing your new love of Squarespace. Hmm. And we have. We've talked about that actually quite a lot over the last couple of weeks. There is a simple fact that sites look better and simpler with Squarespace, just like washing machines last longer with Calgon. <laughs> <laughs> Which will mean nothing, of course, oh, really to anybody do, outside really this country. The theme tune. You can't do the theme tune because we're not allowed to sing it. But they do uh, apparently last longer with Calgon. Can we, can we have a sponsor, please? <laughs> Uh, how much would it? How much would we charge washing machines uh, last night? Five pound fifty, maybe for the week. <coughs> Deal. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, what, what do you think? All the best and Mad Ian March. We are a, a little bit mad, Ian, but we love it. <laughs> so, what was the actual question? I, I think really he wants to know whether um, whether really he should swap to Squarespace now. Hmm. Yeah, everything's simpler with Squarespace, he says. But you know, there's a bit of him that's still loving the Divi designer by the sound of it. But it is driving him nuts. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it ultimately it's personal preference. Mm. You know, there are, uh, and of course, even though I've switched. Um, all my sites to Squarespace mm. there are things on WordPress that it is much better at do you, what do you miss what do you miss actually don't miss any mm. <laughs> anything of it I, I have to admit um, but it, it does you know you do you do have more control over it over WordPress you've got um, obviously much more control over templates and themes mm. in terms of what's going to look different um, but yeah I agree with him in essence Squarespace is simpler in my mind looks nicer the problem the number one problem with squarespace is that it your website will often look like many other websites yeah but don't don't a lot of sites these days yeah it doesn't bother me websites it seems to be you know logo in the middle and you know yeah it doesn't bother me i mean it's menus either side if you're a big big brand then obviously you're going to spend money on having your own designer put things in place so squarespace for me it all sits there i don't have to worry about um, disk space and right. you know bandwidth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the or last backup, or backups or backups. The yeah. last the last host I used and they were very good. I'm not going to mention any names. Were for WordPress. Um, it was excellent, but uh, you know my F16 website that gets you know that's and it gets in excess of five thousand hits a day sometimes. Yeah. You know if I've just launched and put something on there. Um, and it was just like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We've, we're taking your website down until you give us loads more money. Oh, and which Squarespace don't do? Squarespace doesn't do that, no. Mm. So Squarespace is fine for that kind of stuff. Um, but with WordPress, you do have more control over certain things. Mm. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, if simplicity is what you want and you don't want to try and squeeze the life out of it in terms of SEO, then I would go Squarespace. Yeah. Um, one thing I am very grateful for with the Squarespace stuff is that I no longer constantly worrying about keywords and meta tags and all that kind of stuff and yeah. i just stopped thinking about well, it don't now. worry about it we still got to input stuff uh, right? i just don't worry i just well, it's I, not I, going to affect your overall seo performance i don't then. care anymore no. I, I'm, I'm past <laughs> okay. i'm past caring okay no no but the thing is that this year and next year google will be um and they've already announced this will be uh, ranking far more on user experience mm. than Which they is, will be well, on right. technical seo ah, right so well, uh, how, how can they how can they rate who's having a better user experience well they can track they can see who's what's going on on the website how easy is it to navigate what uh, are the calls to action how you many know, people stay longer or have people you know are people are there too many links to categories or tags on a website oh. purely for seo reasons uh-huh. they're, they're getting their head around all of that stuff okay um, and, you know, so that will come. But, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, what I love about my Squarespace site is I can build and put content on there that I'm doing just for the viewer. Yeah. I'm no longer thinking about Google. Mm. And that, I think, is a positive thing because the more you think about Google, the more you'll over-optimise and the more it'll be bad for you. I've thoroughly enjoyed building the new neiljames.com site, which isn't yet live, 
it will be. Um, I've thought, I just, you know, I can't remember the last time I actually said I've really enjoyed building a website. Mm, I love, I love building with uh, Squarespace. I have to say, yeah. although I do tend to do we the same thing on my sites. Should we not be sponsored by Squarespace? Uh, we listen to us both here. Calgon hey. and Squarespace. Calgon and are Square. you listening to yes, us? Yes, thank you very much. We'll have five pound fifty, please. Mm-hmm. No, double that up. Um, so, uh, one more question from you, and then um, I think we'll have a disaster story, and that, that's it for another week. All right, one surely. More, one more question from me. Uh, You've got long, have, long questions here. This you? is a. This is another. Yeah, they're all long. This is from James Souls, a uh, mm-hmm. friend of the show. I calibrate my monitor with a Spider X, but the light in the room I use to work from changes drastically across the day. I'm thinking I should shut the blinds in the day so the light is always from the room lights only, helping yeah. to give a similar light I'll tell you day what, and night. You shut the blind during the day, and your neighbours will start worrying what's going on. What's <laughs> I wanted to ask if there is a specific type of room light bulb, (laughs) light Uh, level, placement of the room, lights, etc., to help the accuracy of what I see on my monitor, or am I going over the top? Slightly. I would say you're going over the top. He does go on to say he's got two monitors, a BenQ... I lo- like the names that the sexiness of models of names is brilliant mm. pd2700u yeah which is a 4k <laughs> monitor and sw2700pt which yeah. is a 2k monitor i've always monitor. thought that about monitors they should have much sexier names shouldn't they why do they need to take on the car type yeah. names you know benq jaguar 20 benq fred <laughs> I always thought the weirdest name for a car was the Vauxhall Adam. I mean, who gives the car a name? There's nothing wrong with the name Adam before you all write in those Adams. And Megan. But but, but a car called Adam? (laughs) No, that was McGann, not Megan. (laughs) So anyway, what's he saying? Light. Uh, Yeah, so light bulbs. Okay, so light light bulbs should not not in any way be shining down, you know, behind you that's going to be back at. The, uh, at the at the monitor of course if you put them behind the monitor and, mm. and dim them that's what i do in here and yes. it works very very well correct you should not have any any light behind no technically however well, behind you, you looking onto the screen correct yeah, yeah. yeah. so you but can behind have the monitor yes. behind the monitor lights yeah. yeah what 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 also is not such a good idea is to edit in total darkness some people think that they'll just put black up blinds and yep. edit in total darkness because then it's unified yes. and that's not good because your eyes can't adjust properly no and then you have all sorts of brightness issues yeah absolutely so uh I, to, to be totally honest with you james i think you are overthinking things um i i i i actually use the spider not the spider the um x right x right um, x right make the spider x but no they, oh no uh, no they don't the, x right uh, oh the i've got the same one actually i pro display i, I, I display pro I display pro yeah. so i use and you would get that so <laughs> we get there in the end i use the x right i display pro which yeah. actually has a little puck dongly like thing oh, yes, that will monitor the the ambient light as it changes and it yeah. will change the calibration accordingly um so that's that's basically what now, i do funny enough i talked to our friend in australia about this and he said waste of time oh really yeah he said don't you know <laughs> yeah fair enough he said don't bother doing that yeah <laughs> uh, our calibration well expert yeah yeah i mean you, but if it works for you i've never seen the screen change so i have to no. uh, 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 probably he's probably <laughs> right <laughs> But that's that. You know, that, it's that was my placebo anyway. Was it? That was my it placebo. It makes you feel better. Now right. I'm going to go and get blackout blinds and paint the walls black, <laughs> yeah. ceiling black. I tell you what, James. Just forget, I tell you what. Calm down, James. Have another beer. Go on. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a champagne. Yeah, but no, no. Good for you for trying to you know to get things right. And you yeah. and and you know you do want something uh, uniformed if you can. But yeah. but don't don't over don't go spending no. loads of money and annoying the wife by having an orange light bulb and stuff like no. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. No, that she wouldn't appreciate that very much. Right. Last thing of the show: photo disaster. Um, Stephen Gemmell. Not so much uh, an out-and-out disaster, but a warning, um, really, for anybody shooting without spare batteries for all their kit. Hi, Kev. Hi, Neil. I'm retired now, but your request brought back um, several moments during my illustrious career. Soon after I started my career as a wedding photographer, I booked a couple who were getting married in St Albans with a reception at the Sculpture Gallery at Woburn Abbey. That's a lovely place. You ever worked there? No. Oh, it's an amazing place. I don't think so. Yeah, incredible. Um, Anyway, I I knew it was going to be a big wedding. They had 350 guests. They do do big ones there, actually, yeah. As we got nearer to the date, I realised the groom was the the son of Ruth Maddock of Heidi High fame. Remember that show? Yeah, loved it. Name me three characters from Heidi High. See if you can. I mean, I love the show, but I don't know if I can remember three characters. Oh, well, there was... There was the 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 children's entertainer that didn't like children. The cleaner. (laughs) Uh, Who was... uh, Polly? No, Polly. Yeah, Polly... 
Oh god, what are we doing here? Oh, this is terrible. But I, I, I rem- love it, and it had all the kinds of characters that you just wouldn't be able to have anymore. Yeah, and there's Shane. What was his name? Shane Ritchie. Shane. No, no, not no, Shane, not Shane Ritchie. Ritchie. Shane. Shane. Somebody Shane. Yeah, Paul Shane. Paul Shane, who yeah. was the the really bad comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ah oh dear, they were the days. People actually paid to go on holiday in those places. Can you believe it? My mum and dad did. Ruth Maddox. I used to have a thing for Ruth Maddox. Yeah. Anyway, her ex-husband was Philip Maddock, the very distinguished actor from the Royal Shakespearean Company, but best known as the captured German U-boat captain in the De- Dad's Army episode and the Don't Tell Him Pike quote by Captain Mannering. Blimey. Anyway, um, he's a really nice bloke, fantastic linguist, and did the uh, the father of the groom speech in five different languages. Cool, go him. Great wedding, lovely couple, kept busy through the day. At the time, I was shooting with my newly acquired Canon 1DS, which is OK, until about 800 ISO, when the images started to get noisy. You had that camera, didn't you? Did it get noisy? No, I didn't have a 1DS, I had a 1D4. Did you? OK, so by then, they'd probably cleaned up the act a bit with that. Yeah. But anyway. yeah, I wouldn't go higher than about 1,200 with it. Wouldn't you? No. Blimey, really? Yeah. Late in the evening, Ruth Maddock decided she wanted some group images outside the venue. I uh, used to use Flash a lot in those days before I switched to Fuji and mirrorless, so I attached to the bottom of the 1DS, I had a quantum battery pack. They're, they they throw out a lot of power, don't they? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a can of Flash on the camera. God, you really had some light there. <laughs> Any morning, you've had the sun. Quantum. Yeah. The the family assembled outside. To my horror, I looked back at the, uh, at the back of the quantum, and it was flashing to tell me the battery was dead. <laughs> oh no! See, that's why you want available light only. <laughs> Rather than look an idiot at this point, I carried on, took the pictures, assuming that the cameras were so good the pictures would be okay. Oh God, have you ever done that before? Yep. <laughs> Yep. Of course, back in 2006, they weren't. The resulting images were pretty terrible. I tried to make something of them, but there was no way I was going to show them to my client. The rest of the images were great, but uh, I was sweating buckets. Thankfully, nobody asked for those pictures, and the cu- couple were happy with the other stuff that I gave them. Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps they guessed that I was bluffing when I actually took them and felt sorry for me. We'll never, ever know. There we are. There's a, there's a lesson to make sure that everything is fully charged before you go out into the world. If you've got a disaster story, send it send it to us, please. Click at fujicast.co.uk. And a reason, of course, Kev, not to use flash is what you would say, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You wouldn't have had that problem at all. I do like the name of that flash unit, a quantum. Quantum. Now, you... that is a good way of naming a problem. It is, isn't it? Quantum. Yeah. It makes it it's big. You had quantums, didn't you? Which ones I've did you have? I've got Elenchrom something or other. Didn't you have that sort range of... Range finders. Ra- uh, no, the ra- Ranger. The Ranger system. Quant- the Elenchrom Ranger system. Yeah, I've got one of them. Very, very I've good. got two of them in a box. <laughs> we never used them, did you? <laughs> no. Never used them. No. Can I have them? They can go with the 35 mil one. <laughs> 1.4 that I've still got of yours. You can have them. <laughs> I'd be very glad I'm, I'm sure I could think of something for them. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for another week. Thank you very much um, for, for being with us. If you've got any questions, then send them in, please, to click at fujicast.co.uk. Your, um, your wonderful... Uh, reviews that you leave uh, are fantastic and we as we say every week we do read every single one if you'd like to if you'd like to uh, find out a little bit more about what we do then there's an easy place to go just go to the website the new well, it's not so shiny new anymore is it really but we keep calling it shiny it's still shiny just it's not new shiny, not so new yeah uh, like me to, and you <laughs> to fujicast.co.uk and uh, that's where you'll also find lots of links like to um, to video some, some how do you pick the films by the way that go on the website uh, if I like them, I put them on there. Yeah. Basically, uh, I haven't really done done too much investigating recently. No. But I found I found a couple. I put a, a really nice black and white film. I found on Ministry of Shadows. I found it on Vimeo. All right. So one, I will. It was. It's basically an underwater dive, but it all in, done in black and white. In black and white. Wow. I bet that looks amazing. Beautifully filmed. Is that on the Is that on the Fujicast site? Yet? No, no. It's on Ministry of Shadows. But I will. I will start putting things like that on Fantastic. on uh, Fujicast as well. Uh, music was um, uh, as always um, extra music from art, the wonderful artlist.io and Blue Wednesday of course were the main theme and we'll be back um, next week see you then Kev bye bye the Fujicast is an independent loading zone production email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way 